So today we're going to talk about something that's totally practical and you can use daily in your job. We are going to recreate the dial-up modem in JavaScript. So uh, maybe you guys have a memory of this. Oh, we have audio. So this may sound familiar and bring back great memories. Connecting to the internet, this is what it used to be like. So that's enough of that. So once we were online, our experience was something like this. Yes. Wonderful progressive loading, slow connection, a beautiful thing. So who am I? My name's Sam Sacconi. I'm a developer at a consultancy in Rhode Island called Mojo Tech. Uh, I write software by day uh, and typically make problems on open source projects at night. So let's start off with the question, what is sound? So sound is vibrations that travel through the air. And for us, we pick up those vibrations or pressure changes with our eardrum, and that's converted to an electrical signal that our brain interprets, and then we perceive sound. But in this case, my computer microphone is picking up this sound, and then I'm plotting that raw PCM data onto the screen. And this is how most of us think about sound when we see a waveform. We see audio, a visualization of it. So what is data? And these are the sound and data are the two components that are going to help us put together a modem. So data for a computer is zeros and ones. It's binary data, it's state encoded. But when we use a computer, we don't see zeros and ones. We see images, MP3s, zip files, Git repositories. So we understand the binary data through a program which decodes this binary information into formats that we're familiar with, that we can perceive. So how do we get data into audio? We have our waveform and we have our binary information. Well, obviously it's an encoding problem, so we need to figure out how to do that. Humans are pretty good at encoding data. I'm speaking to you, you can understand me. You can understand language. You can understand what I'm saying. I'm communicating ideas. However, communication breaks down when you don't speak the language. If I was speaking a different language that you didn't know, you wouldn't understand what I was saying. You wouldn't get any information. So language becomes the data encoding for speech, meaning this noise that I'm making would mean nothing unless you knew English. Just be noise. So how then do computers speak? How do computers talk to each other? Computers don't have a voice. Computers don't know how to say things. Computers need a way to verbalize. They need a language and a mechanism to transmit information. So. How do we do this? I have my two computers, and I have a wire in between them. How do they talk? It's, it's a good question. So to understand this, I want to step back in time, in the early days of communications. There were three primary drivers for modern day communications. Need to be fast, need to be easy to use, and need to be cheap to implement. So obviously these three have been optimized over time, but anything initially was great. So in 1792, uh, this guy Claude and his brother were hanging out in France and they were out in the fields and they heard 
the bell of the church ring. And I said, wow, that's great. That tells me what time it is. I said, well, you know, when I'm at the house and you're in the field and I want to tell you to come back, we should figure out some bell so we could communicate. So they went inside and got these pans. I said, okay, well, you're in the field. I got this pan. I'm going to bang on it. And when you hear that, you know to come back. So it was communication over remote distances. People didn't have to be face to face. They didn't have to walk up to each other and say something. They could hit this pan, and they had this code that they agreed on. So for a while, that's what they did. They hit these pans. They said, hey, great, we can talk from great distances. I said, well, you know, this, this, our neighbors are getting kind of mad. It's kind of loud. So we need a better way. I said, well, OK, well, I have this telescope. So how about I look at you, and you could make some symbols, and I could understand it. So communication over a great distance. So this idea evolved and evolved, and they came up with this idea of an optical telegraph. And it sounds fancy, but it's, it's not. It's this tower that you can sort of see with these, these needles on either end. And there was this code. That one was pointed here. This meant A. And then the other side, they would then point that there. And so the next station would look with their telescope and say, oh, well, an A. OK, A. So they'd be able to communicate a message across vast distances. However, it had some downsides. If it was foggy, didn't work. If it was nighttime, didn't work. It took three people to operate, so it was kind of expensive. And it was kind of error prone, if you can imagine. If you just had the angles, like, oh, that's a B, no, that's an A. So it was very lossy. But this was used in France widely up until around 1837. So this was a revolution. There are these lines all over the place in France. People are like, this is modern day living. Along comes this guy, Samuel Morris. So France, you know, they were cutting edge. They were leading the front on remote communications. And the United States was still in the dark ages. They didn't, there was like one optical telegraph line, but it wasn't really used. So um, Samuel Morris was hanging out. Uh, in a show in New York, because he was you know, a painter, of course. And he got a letter from his father that his wife had fallen ill. So a horse, a guy on a horse came up and gave him a letter and said, oh, your wife is ill. And he says, uh-oh, I better get home. And so he wrote a response and sent it. And then before he even left, another horse, or actually two days later, another person came and delivered another letter that said his wife had died. So he said, wow, I hadn't even had time to like, send a response or get home because there was such a delay in this communication. So he was distraught, and he went back to Europe uh, for his wife's funeral. And he met someone on the boat who said, hey, you heard of this thing called electricity? And at this time, electricity was a parlor trick. People didn't understand how it worked. It was viewed as kind of magical. He said, well, look, if I have this magnet and I pass a current through this wire, this magnet changes. And this concept of electromagnetism. And he had this idea that I can create a communication system using this electromagnetism concept where I pass a current through the wire using a rhythmic tone. Uh, so it's both on off, Morse code, and also temporal, so a long dash, short dash. And he pushed forward, came back to the United States, eventually convinced people that this is a real thing. And people didn't want to believe him because it was still like, kind of weird. So he actually would run wires from one room to another and have people in both rooms and send a message. And then a third party would then verify that the message was real because they thought it was some magic trick. So Morse code kind of swept the nation. Everywhere was connected in a matter of 20 years, 30 years. There were these telegraphy lines that ran all across the world. So it made it possible for people to communicate from one side of the world to the other immediately. So you could know the price of alligator skin in New York every day versus once every six months. So people loved it. It made communicating to relatives in California not take 10 days, because that was as fast as it could happen before this was invented. So it also put out of business the Pony Express, which is unfortunate. So, OK, here we are. We have these telegraph lines running across the country, across the world. These lines are kind of expensive to run. They have them running under the ocean. It's crazy. We can talk to Europe, everywhere. 
So this guy, Emil, comes along. And he says, hey, uh, these Morse code operators, they're really expensive to hire. Incredibly expensive. They're like the modern day software developers. Like they can go anywhere they want. It's like, oh wow, you can transmit at 90 characters per second. You're amazing. But he said, well, you know, this is, I need to make this easier for normal people. So he came up with this new code. So not Morse code, it's this Baudot code. And he came up with the keyboard. It's a corded keyboard. Uh, so people could be trained on it a lot faster and didn't have to be highly skilled to send information. So it became cheaper. It's like high sought after Morse code operator, not necessary anymore. And an interesting note is the term baud actually comes from this guy's name, uh, which is pretty interesting. So a baud is a single bit of information, how many bits we can send per second. So up until this point, um, we were still using one line for one message. Someone, an operator would be on the line, you would actually be connected to another place through patch series or a single wire, and uh, one person could be operating at a time. So obviously, as people wanted to send more and more messages, this didn't scale very well. So he came up, Bado came up with a way to multiplex sending information. And this was a temporal multiplexing, because he realized, hey, when people are using these lines, most of it's just empty space, because the person has to read the message and transmit it, and there's just a lot of blank space. So the way this works is there were like four or five operators at a time, and everyone would hear this tick. It says, okay, the second tick is yours, the third tick is yours, and people would send, and on the receiving end, they'd hear the tick, so they'd know how to split the messages. So people would send at 30, 40 words per minute, and then hear this tick, okay, next person, next person, next person. So it allowed people to send up to like 240 baud. So we were really cruising. 1855, it was great. In parallel, uh, this guy, Alexander Bell, he made the telephone, actually. Um, he was working on this thing called harm uh, harmonic telegraph, or audible telegraphy. He figured out that, hey, if we change the resistance in the signal that we're sending, we can actually create tones. And he figured out that we could use tuning forks on both ends, and we could use sympathetic vibration to actually send information between two modems and then stack those tones on top of each other. So this one was sending at A, then B, C, D, and it allowed 10 signals to be on one telegram line at a time, which was crazy because it means we didn't have to run more lines and it was cheaper. So obviously this was adapted pretty rapidly by the Morse code community because it meant that more operators could operate on a single line. So send more messages, higher throughput. It was great. And also this eventually led to phone lines, dedicated phone lines being run as well. So audible multiplexing, what does that mean? Okay, so uh, if I, whoa. Okay, so if we play this tone right here, and you just pay attention to this, and then I come in with this, if you're listening for one tone, you as the receiver, it doesn't matter what else is going on, because you can hear one piece of it, just like the cocktail party effect. You can focus in on one thing and ignore all the noise. So audible multiplexing only meant that the receiver could listen to an individual tone and then transcribe it. Now this was automated, obviously, but uh, this was the basic concept that made multiplexing possible. People didn't really understand that they were stacking frequencies and then could extract it, but it was based on very basic concepts. So, let's step back again. How's data encoded into audio? Well, we're using this thing called frequency shift keying. So we have our frequency. Let's imagine that carrier signal on top is our, carrier, is our base signal. And we modulate that carrier signal and we create higher frequency sections. So your tone goes from low to high, low to high. And if you look at this graph on the bottom, you can sort of imagine that the, the wider frequencies right there, lower, are zero and then one. So we can encode, encode state into this frequency using this modulation scheme. And so 
we have this idea of audio frequency shift keying. So an FSK only means that we're shifting a frequency, but we could shift a frequency that we can't hear. So to transmit this over phone lines, for instance, we need to make it in the audible spectrum, so something we can hear. So a, a 10 baud modem might sound something like this. Okay, so slow, but you can hear the individual tones. The frequency is modulating from low, high, low, high, low, high. And you could manually write down 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. And then you could turn that back into information according to whatever encoding scheme you're using. Now, as modems got more and more powerful, uh, we were sending at a higher baud rate, which a human couldn't decode. So that probably sounds a little more familiar to you. That sounds more like a modem. And that's only 600 baud. As it got faster and faster, it just sounds like static. Okay. So, in 1908, I think we sort of had this breakthrough, those three points. Uh, we had these teletype machines. It allowed for non-skilled operators on both ends to send in and receive messages. So I actually brought a version of a teletype here today. Um, so here it is. This is actually a telephonic device for the deaf that's still in use today. It allows for deaf people to type and put a phone on top and then send and receive messages. Um, so put it up so you guys can hear it. So there it is. All right, so what you're hearing there, if you pay attention, you can actually hear at the beginning, you can hear the low and high. So this is transmitting at 45.45 baud using Baudot-Murray encoding. So things that were invented in the 1800s are being used today without any change, which is pretty crazy. So that's a teletype machine. We can send information over a phone line. It's great. So well, why did we have to do audible frequency shifting, shift keying, and why, why does any of this make sense? Well, OK. Bell had established these phones, and people had phone lines. Telegraph lines were proprietary. People, companies would pay for them, and then to send a message would cost money. But a lot of people had phone lines. So. Someone said, well, I hate having to pay for these companies to send my information when I already have, I can talk to someone, so why can't I send information? Well, I can hack the phone system. So an audio FSK worked on the existing infrastructure. And the modem was a way to connect, I, um, it, was, it was a way to connect teleprinters over regular phone lines. It demodulates and modulates data to be sent over a normal phone line. So this might not make sense, so let me explain it. What the phone company does is they're smart, and they say, okay, when a person talks into the phone, they use this much of the frequency spectrum. And you know, we can drop out individual chunks, and we can shift that entire voice transmission over to here, so you can't hear it. And so we can take all the phone calls that are happening and jam it onto a single line, or three or four lines, by shifting the audio. So when people are trying to send information over phone lines, if they're trying to send at frequencies that the human voice doesn't send and the phone lines have determined that, well, you know, humans don't talk in this spectrum or this, these frequencies, so we're just going to drop them, then your data wouldn't send. So the modem shifts it to act like a voice so you can actually hear it, and it sounds like if someone was talking. And then the phone company shifts it. And then on the receiving end, the phone company unshifts it. And the modem takes that frequency and shifts it over where it's supposed to be. So in a way, a modem is making it possible to send information in a way that maybe you weren't supposed to. All right, so history time is over. Let's talk about some JavaScript. So recreating a modem in the browser with JavaScript. There's a few pieces that we need to do this. Um, the first is oscillator node, and it's pretty simple. It allows us to we make some cool music, but it allows us to 
shift the frequency over time. Frequency and time and shift. Okay, those are the words that I said before, and now we can just apply that to put some data in it, I think. Okay. So, now we can shift this frequency, and now we need to do some processing of this audio data. So the API is in flux still, but right now it's called the script, node, script processor node. And what it allows us to do is process chunks of audio just in time with a given bin size and sampling rate. And those are just words. doesn't mean anything. It's fine. <laughs> but it's important. It allows us to look at the raw PCM data and you know, run some math on it. All right. OK, so if we have the first two pieces, we can shift the frequency and we can look at the data. OK. Uh, so now we need to take a string and say, hello. Oops. OK, cool. So string to binary. That's not so hard. Just a little bit of JavaScript. Cool. All right. So we have our binary. And we know that we can make noise. So now we have to take this binary and put it into our waveform. So we know that we need to do that by shifting the frequency and modulating the frequency to high and low. All right, so OK. Oh, I should have played that. That would have been good. Here. Let's Redo, redo this one. Okay. Okay. Sweet. So if we look at this visualization of the data, you can see dark patches and light patches. And the dark patches are higher frequency, and the lighter patches obviously are lower frequency. So we go 0, 1, 1. Okay. And you heard it. So, okay, we've made another step. We can take text to binary and encode it in a waveform by shifting the frequency using the oscillator node over time. Sweet. So the fun part comes next, which is data extraction. So I drew um, a perfect waveform for you guys so you can get a sense of what we're working with. This is the hard part, because we have this waveform, but how does this relate to binary data? Because I just see a waveform. Well, remember those words that I said before, that bin? Word? It's weird. So we have our bits. Zero, one. Great. And we know that we're sending at a certain baud rate, which is bits per second. And we know how many bins that we get per second. And so we can take our bins, which come from the script processor node, and we can combine them together. And we say, OK, the sum of these bin, bins, or sum, is equal to a single bit. And then that bit is 0 or 1. Then we can pass those zeros and 1s to our decoding, and then we're good. All right, with me still? We're good. OK. So how do we get from a wave to frequency intensity? So we have these bins, and I don't know how to tell you what frequency is happening inside of those bins. So I went to Wikipedia, and I searched. And then I was scared. <laughs> so <laughs> there's this cool algorithm that this guy made. I was on the Manhattan Project. Uh, he's like, hey, this is an algorithm for extracting a single frequency. It's called the Gortzel algorithm. And all it does is you tell it what frequency you're looking for, and it tells you how intense that frequency is. That's it. And it was made to run on low-powered systems, so I'm like, yes, it's perfect for JavaScript. <laughs> and so any web audio people out there right now or audio people might be like, well, you should have just used the baseband filter with the high Q value. And I'd be like, you're right, I should have, and I tried it, except for it was too, it was not specific enough, basically. So I need something really fine-grained, and so I had to implement my own. So Gortzel. You didn't understand what I said. Uh, it allows us to extract a single target frequency intensity over time. So we have our bins. We know that they relate to a bit. And we know that the bins, if the frequency is high, is a 1. And if it's low, it's a 0. All right, so we're going to look for the occurrence of our high frequency. And if it's not there, we're going to assume it's a 0. Perfect. So I drew another great picture for you. Gortzel results in something like this. We have our waveform. We run over chunks of the wave, and we get these purple circles, low or high. And from there, you can almost say that, OK, this is a 0, this is a 1, this is a 0, this is a 1. But then we get this weird like bleed through, and it's like, what is this, a 0 or a 1? I'm not sure. 
So it's still not working yet. And I was really sad. So we want to get this analysis to as close as binary as possible. So I did some more Googling, and I came across this thing called a Hamming window, or a windowing function. So since the audio that we're analyzing is non-periodic, we get spectral leak leakage. I mean, obviously, like, come on. <laughs> so by applying a Hamming window, we're able to remove noise and lobe leakage, because like, can't be having any of those lobes in our audio. And we use a Fourier transform, and then it works. I said, like, OK, cool. <laughs> so really, it was like a formula. And it sort of made it all work, which I was happy about. OK, so let's look at what happens when we look at the frequency intensity of our audio. Oh, probably not audio. Cool. Let me run it again. OK, that looks better. So the red is our high bits. And you heard that lead in, the high, and then the lead in at the end. Those are our marks. And then our squawk, which is our data, happens in between. And you can see that we have this nice gap in between. So 0, 1. Perfect. So now we just need to take one more step. Of course, one more step. Okay. So let's put it all together. And I'm going to send this at 300 baud because I'm crazy. OK, that one didn't work. Let's run it one more time. Oh, still got some. There we go. Great. OK, so it worked. So I'm sending text, encoding it in audio, getting that audio, decoding it, well, getting it out of the waveform, and then decoding the binary and putting that back to text on the, on the screen. And it works. So pretty cool. So obviously, that was too easy. Come on. So what if there was noise on the line? Like a telephone, your mom would pick up the phone when you were connected to Battle.net, and you were like doing great in Warcraft 2. And you're like, mom, don't pick up the phone. And then your connection dropped, and you lost. And it's like, yes. So we got to handle that noise on the line. OK. But remember remember that Gortzel filter? Gortzel you think? Yeah, we could extract single frequencies, and it ignored everything else, and that lobe spectral stuff, I think we're going to be OK. Let's see. So what this is, I've, I've made some noise on the line. You'll hear it. OK. So <laughs> we got a little issue here. So web audio is a little flaky sometimes, believe it or not, especially when you're doing this. Hey, OK, that's better. So if I, <laughs> so what, what you're seeing here is some of this random noise is interfering with our, with our signal, the frequencies matching up. But at the same time, we're still able to reconstruct quite a bit of the information. So with some more advanced uh, methods to look at the data, reconstructing it would become trivial. Um, and I'll just run it one more time, because it works sometimes, I promise. Uh, no, OK, who cares? All right, so uh, we're at 300 baud now. It works pretty well. Uh, what if we wanted more speed? Because 300 baud is incredibly slow. Well, of course, we can multiplex it. And so multiplexing, in our case, is we're actually stacking the frequencies on top. So I have one oscillator that's, or one high tone that's at 2200 hertz, and another one at 3000 hertz, and then another one at so on and so forth. So at 300 baud with two multiplexers, we can go 600 baud. And that sounds like a good number. Let's try that. Sweet. It worked. All right, let's be crazy. Let's go up to like 1,200 baud, maybe. OK, still OK. There we go. That's better. All right, so still good. So that's 1,200 baud. Uh, yeah, let's go a little bit faster. Let's have eight multiplexers. So hey, all right, cool. So we. We are cruising 2,400 baud. Yes. All right. So all this basically showed you this is how modems work. 
and <laughs> I made it work in the browser. It works all right. Um, but what's interesting to think is how our Wi-Fi works and how Bluetooth works. It doesn't use frequency modulation. It uses phase modulation, but it's the exact same concepts. Obviously, their algorithms are way better than what mine are, and things work a lot better. But uh, the same principles apply. So we take this concept that was originally invented in 1830s, and we can trace it all the way up to modern day and how this is all working right now. So she's like, OK, well, obviously, that was so boring. You need to do more. So like, what else could we do? Well, air gap communication with this actually works. Um, Google actually came out with something the other day called Google Tone. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> but they're using this private C API that they didn't tell anyone about. So they're actually offloading it to hardware more than I am. So it's cool. Um, but this code actually works, uh, which is nice. Um, but imagine this. Like, imagine you had a modem running on your browser. And someone was like, hey, I wrote a better version of the firmware for your modem. They could just send you a JavaScript payload, and you could dynamically reload your modem, like the actual firmware on your modem, which is kind of crazy to think about. Or you know, like, why not use WebRTC? So all ideas, it's things that maybe I'll do someday. So uh, all this code is online if you want it. Um, but yeah, hopefully this shows like what's possible in JavaScript and how we can step back in history and kind of understand where the things that we take, take for granted have come from, which I think is cool. So thank you for listening to me. <laughs>